The stakes are high and we're indeed back here for Breakfast Central on News Central. It's been a fantastic week all along from Monday all the way through to today, which is Friday. And like they say, it's a very special Friday because it's holiday here in Nigeria. That's for those who are watching us from outside Nigeria. I want to say good morning and welcome to Breakfast Central. So many stories to dig into. Uh, so many happenings from different parts of the country and you can rightly say that nigeria is going through its very own tough times economically and you could say politically the reason is because we've seen a political party hold a national conference that indeed uh, has gotten everyone talking not just that we've also seen a lot of reactions negative and some positive concerning the um, establishment of uh, a new state being called by ohanez indibo so many, so many, so many things to talk about. And I want to use this medium to say good morning to you. Joining me this morning is Mazino Appeal. Good morning to you, Mazino. Good morning, Jonathan Hansen. Look at you looking all uh, hairy. Is that a beard I see? Uh, <laughs> it looks good on you. It's okay. It's all right. You have to go there, right? It, man. I, I, they say change is the only constant thing in life, indeed, and indeed. Um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying yeah. to have a change, a little one. Are you excited about the news this morning? We've got so much to talk about. Yeah, yeah, so much. Yeah. Um, so much. I, I found it very interesting that the PDP is beginning to get a remix, let me put it that way, as the LP party members are beginning to defect. We're going to talk about that inside the news. Just makes it very obvious that politics is politics in Nigeria, very typical of every political party to be a mix of every other political party. That's right. I mean, the governor of um, Enugu State, um, His Excellency Peter Mba, uh, is of the PDP, uh, the opposition party. And then, uh, like they say in politics, if you need to get something done, of course, you need to look at the brighter side of life, which is you might need to be part of the ruling party. So it's, uh, it's a no-brainer to see some Labour Party members um, defecting and going to the PDP. Uh, five of them we do here. Mm. I wonder what, uh, what will happen to the others as well. Well, it's very interesting, really. The question is, will the LP still remain like what it was, people's beacon of hope when it comes to politics in Nigeria, especially for the young people with all these defections? Uh, what will remain or who's going to remain in the party? Uh, maybe we're looking at a new party being put together in the horizon for next elections. Not too sure, but we'll see how that unfolds. Well, that, that's, been, that's been mentioned many times. We did hear um, that there was uh, a, a, a seemingly... A uh, new party that would be formed. Uh, many had mentioned that it would have to do with Peter Obi uh, joining forces with um, uh, with another political juggernaut, and then they would form a strong opposition party that would go against the ruling party. Uh, many said it was going to be between. Um, it was going to be uh, Peter Obi. Uh, of course, um, His Excellency, the former Vice President of Nigeria, mm. Alaji Atikwa Bubaka. And uh, then you also have uh, one or two persons to make it stronger so that 20, uh, uh, 27 will be one election that Nigerians will live to remember. But then again, uh, we did have a guest here on breakfast who did come forward to say there's no such thing that is being thought of, that Labour Party remains the biggest opposition party. And we do see what Labour Party is going through. Anyway, uh, Mazino, you're not alone. Neither am I. We do have... Uh, the you know the shining light uh, in the house. Oliver Modi also joins us this morning. She doesn't have a beard, by the way. <laughs> I have to step back. I have to step Whoa, back. Jonathan, that will be a totally different kind of person. <laughs> I have to step back because welcome, I mean, Olive. I think that Joe's beard is a very welcome development. Oh my goodness! I think that it has, it has, it is a personality. We have to give it a name on the show. Wow! So I just have to set, step back and allow his beard to shine. Whoa! And I think it's a very good look. It's a different. Obviously, it, Jonathan, we're all invested in your beard. Wow! 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 What did you say? <laughs> is that, is that the, is that you you're all in, interested, invested in the, in the yeah, beard? Yeah, yeah. And it's connecting. It's not every day you see beards connect. So. Oh. Congratulations, Joe Hansen, and your beard, and welcome uh, to your beard. To <laughs> this show, we have to give the beard a name. But I, I'm very excited. It's the weekend, Mazino. Ho hopefully, uh, we can see some pleasant stories. One of the good news that we've seen, of course, is the fact that the, the young children from Kuriga have been reunited with their parents. We mm. think that's amazing news. Uh, we also look forward to getting more information. Kaduna State Government Governor, I beg your pardon, has granted them scholarships mm. through his foundation. Um, he's also talked about the teacher who unfortunately uh, passed, you know, was killed during this uh, yeah. incident. And 
promising to take care of the child of the, of the teacher. We're hoping to get further details on this. Like we're hoping that the story is fleshed even better uh, as we proceed. And welcome. It's the news on Breakfast Central. Now let's begin. My name is Mazino Appeal. Nigeria has been thrust into darkness yet again as the national electricity grid centrally managed from Oshobo Ocean State suffered a collapse at approximately 4.30 p.m. on Thursday evening, leaving millions of homes and businesses without power. The development marks the fourth time the grid is collapsing since the first three months of this year, adding to challenges that have long plagued Nigeria's power sector. The chairman of Eco Electricity Distribution Company, Dario Tubu, has issued a disclaimer on a publication made by a board member, Davo, or rather Babor Egregor. In a statement, Utuba said the attention of the board of directors has been drawn to the recent statements online and print media from Babo Egregor supposedly acting on behalf of the board. This is to state that the board of Eco Electricity Distribution PLC did not and has not authorized Babo Egregor to issue any statement or press release on its behalf. And now on to the kidnapped or rescued school children in Kuriga. The kidnapped and now freed school children of Government Secondary School and LEA Primary School, Kuriga, Kaduna State, earlier yesterday evening returned to their communities. After 16 days in captivity, the children were released on Sunday in Zamfara State and brought to the Kaduna State Government House on Monday. The Kaduna State Governor Uba Sani has promised free education to the freed 137 school children of the LEA Primary School and Government Secondary School. Sani added that the school and the Kuriga community would be renovated all under the Uba Sani Foundation. Now, six members of the Enugu State House of Assembly under the platform of the Labour Party have defected to the state, uh, have defected to the state chapter of the People's Democratic Party. The defected lawmakers include Ejike Eze of Igweze North 1, Johnson Ugu of Enugu North, Princess Ugu of Enugu South Rural, Pius Eze Ugu of Nsuka West, Amuka Williams of Igwe Kiti East, and Osita Eze of Oji River. And South Africa's Electoral Commission said on Thursday it had excluded former President Jacob Zuma from standing in the May 29 general elections. Ex-President Zuma said they received an objection which upheld Commission President Musotho Mopweya um, without giving details. The decision can be appealed if lodged before April 2nd. Zuma was forced out of office in 2018 under a cloud of corruption allegations. South Africa's country's Department of Transport said 45 people have died in a bus crash that occurred Thursday in South Africa's northeastern province of Limpopo. The crash, which involved a passenger bus allegedly transporting people from Botswana to Moria, a town in Limpopo, killed at least 45 people and seriously injured one. And that's all for now. I'm Azino Peel. Back to you, Joe and Olive. Thank you so much, Mazino Pill. Sad story then, South Africa. The boss, uh, 45 persons uh, dead. I, I did hear a little girl survived uh, the incident, but they said she's in a critical condition. Mm. Uh, very sad. And then, of course, um, the other story that's got to do with Jacob Zuma. Um, so many things happening from the African continent, but as usual, you can trust us here on News Central. Uh, we'll do touch base with these stories as well. Absolutely, we will. We'll see you again at 9 a.m. As you know, thank you very much for bringing us the news. Thank you very much, Olive. Thank you very much, Joe. The OVA of the Urubu Kingdom in Ueli South Local Government Area of Delta State, His Royal Majesty Clement Ogenerukewe Ikolo Rekwe One has surrendered himself to the Nigerian police in the state. Ikolo turned himself in to the Delta State Police Command in Asaba at about 6.57 p.m. on Thursday and was received by the State Police Commissioner, C.P. Abaniwanda Olufemi. The monarch was one of the eight persons the Nigerian military Thursday morning declared wanted for their role and connection in the gruesome killing of 17 soldiers around the Okwama community in Eurobo Kingdom of Ueli South. The royal father was said to have surrendered to the police to prove his innocence in the controversy surrounding the murder of the military men in one of his communities. Okoma and Urubu community is one of the over 40 communities under the lordship of the monarch in Urubu Kingdom. Briefing journalists before surrendering to the police, the monarch denied any involvement in the killing of the slain soldiers. 
He called on the federal and Delta state governments to constitute an independent panel to, of inquiry uh, to investigate the killing of the military police within the Oklahoma community of his kingdom. Uh, also, the state police uh, public relations officer, Bright Daffy, confirmed this to newsmen late yesterday evening that the monarch has surrendered to the police. Let's take a listen uh, to what he had to say. That God would grant... Well, like I said earlier, I'm not running away from anybody because I have done no wrong. I have committed no crime. And I, like I said, I, I would rather add value to humanity than take away from humanity. So my, my number is in the public space. I attend functions until recently with all these happenings. I'm also, I've also uh, given a press conference earlier condemning this act. So I am not in any shape or form running from anywhere. I am available anytime I am called upon. The only thing is that I know that I have committed no crime. I am not in support of what has happened at all. So once again, I want to console the families of the bereaved, our valent soldiers, and my prayer is that God will grant their souls eternal rest through Christ our Lord. And I further pray that the true culprits of this crime should be brought to book to prevent them from committing further crimes. And there we have it. He's totally denied the allegations and uh, expressed shock and surprise at seeing his name. And there were other people who have been declared wanted as well. Um, the names of the other people who were declared wanted are Professor Ikpipo Arthur, Andoway Dennis Bakriri, Akewuru Daniel. We also have um, Akewuru Daniel Omotebo, a.k.a. Amagwen. We have Akata Malawa David, Sinclair Oliki, and of course, Clement Ikolo Ogenerukewe. We have Ruben Baru and Igoliev. There's so many. Um, these are the updates that we have, and these are the names that have been released to, so far. The traditional ruler did say that he had no hand in this, and that, of course, it's not in line with his Catholic faith. Um, our thoughts and our prayers are with the families of the slain officers. We talked about this yesterday, yeah. about the fact that they've been buried, and uh, the government has promised... and you know, made promises regarding the education of their children mm -hmm. uh, to any extent to tertiary institution, talked about giving them houses in a, a house, at least each of them having a house in any part of the country, which we think is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Watching the video, you know, it was very, nos I don't know if it's nostalgia, that's the word, but it, it made us feel very proud to watch the video, that they were honored in such a way, very deserving. Our force men, our military men deserve to be honored, uh, but not just in death more importantly, in life. And that's the part that I, I would always want to highlight. You know how they say that you shouldn't give people their flowers when they can no longer smell them. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that, you know, this highlights a number of issues. One, boundaries dispute. Um, highlighting the fact that we need further information regarding exactly what happened between Okoma and Okoloba. Um, highlighting the, the details, the minute details we haven't yet gotten to the bottom of. And also uh, talking about how we need to prioritize the welfare. And I know that that's not the case in here. I'm only bringing this up because a number of people say, oh, this is great that they're doing this to them now that yeah. they have passed. But we're hoping that the average force man, because the moment you've signed to be a part of the army, you are signing to die. You are willing to die for your country. So that if that happens, your family is adequately catered for, you know, very well taken care of. We've seen situations where a number of people, army officers, we've heard, of army officers dying and their wives being thrown out of the barracks, their family members not being catered to. And I know that that will not, I believe that that will not be the case for these slain officers. But I'm just hoping that in the, in the nearest future, we, we're doing more to prioritize the men of our forces. I agree. I agree with you. Um, it, it's, a sad, it's a sad story. Uh, we, we've, we've, we've talked about this every now and then. We've seen what the president has done, quite commendable, um, being there for them, appearing also ensuring that he spoke um you know when you speak to people who have gone who are going through a tough situation like this it instills confidence to know that they do have you not just as a a, a person or the chief in commander but as someone who can also make decisions that would lead to the betterment of their lives and their families and that's what the president did he spoke 
He also ensured that um, in his statement that the perpetrators will be brought to book. Yeah. And it's quite commendable that as soon as he did that, um, you know, a few hours later, um, yesterday, the names did come out yes. and these names surfaced. And everybody's talking about, okay, the names, oh, yes, we do have eight of them. And then we do have um, the monarch coming out and saying, no, it must have been an error in between that he's not guilty. And it also takes a lot to come out, hold a press conference, and tender or give yourself to the security operators and say, here I am. You can interrogate I me. I have nothing to hide. So that's commendable. What I was waiting for was, uh, anyway, it's still early days. Let's wait till possibly the end of today. Let's see if the other seven will do the same. Well, although or the if they will be on the run. Because he's a leader. He's a traditional leader. Obano de go transfer. Uh, wait. Really. We, you know can't see, really run we will not say Obano de go transfer. Uh, but at least for the fact that you, if, if they were to be found easily, they wouldn't be wanted. They wouldn't be on the wanted list. But since they, it's been made known that they are wanted, I think it's high time they also come forth and say, listen, this is who I am. You're looking for me? I am available. So what did I do? It, it, it's going to be a long one, but I also must say I respect the, uh, the thoughts of other um, elder statesmen who have said it's not just about prosecuting um, Oklahoma communities. It's also listening to what the communities have to say about the incidents because it's like we just have a one-sided story. That's what they're saying. That is just a one-sided story in the press, in the media, that this is what happened. And do recall that when this um, case came up, um, Olive, we heard different, I don't know if you recall, we yeah. heard different stories about yeah, what happened. Of, um, they were going to rescue theories. somebody. It's about oil. It's, uh, it, there's a community who took so, so many. So many. So many stories. Yeah. Indeed. But yes, we were glad to see that you know, this is uh, making them, there's progress being made with the investigation and that it's not just something that Nigerians made a lot of noise about and it was swept under the rug. And I'm hoping that it's not just naming of suspects, that we get to actually find who the actual culprits are and they're made to face the law. Anyway, we'll move on from uh, the updates with Okoma and Okolaba and head over to um, Southeast Nigeria, where Alex Igbo Group, uh, the Apex Igbo Group, I beg your pardon, Ohane Zindibu, has reiterated its call for restructuring of the country and the creation of additional states and the Southeast, thereby demanding the de devolution of power in the ongoing constitutional review by the National Assembly. Well, according to the uh, President General of the Group, uh, Chief Emmanuel Iwanyawu, at a one-day retreat of Hannes Indigo held in Inugo and tagged um, Akobweje. Lamented that the region has lost trillions of Naira due to the imbalance in Southeast and is set to sue the Nigerian government over the marginalization of the zone in the state creation, adding that it was unfair for the Northwest to have seven states while other regions have six states and the Southeast is left with only five. Well, joining us this morning, of course, he's a man who wears so many hats. He's an investment uh, banker. You could say he's also an economist. Uh, when it comes to politics, he's there. And guess what? He's also uh, a, a staunch follower of uh, what the Ohanese Indigo is indeed uh, calling for. We do have Naime Kabiariri, uh, Chairman of Ohanese Committee on Agriculture. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. You see, we, we still find it as a struggle to know where you fit in, whether you are this, you are that. A man that. of many talents. I mean, it's a pleasure to have you here this morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so let, let's go straight into the conversation. Um, there are calls to sue the government uh, based on what we just uh, mentioned. Uh, what are your thoughts about um, going further to ask for more states to be created? And what does it mean for Hanez Ndibo at this time that we live in, especially with the new um, regime of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And uh, I think um, the call by the President General of the Worldwide is long overdue. And uh, one of the reasons why Nigeria is where we are today is because of the issues of injustice, inequities, and a lot of double standards across the facets and across every works and life in Nigeria. We need to take excursion back to history. Prior to 1914, there was nothing like Nigeria before the amalgamation. Before the independence of 1960, our forebears, our founding fathers, Dr. Nam Dazikwe, 
Sama to Bello, Chief of Buffalo, Mia Wolo, Anthony Enahoro. They had several summits and conferences and deliberations and meetings, both here in Nigeria and in the UK. They discovered and understood clearly the heterogeneous nature of Nigeria and the kind of powerful potentials that this country has if we could come together under a constitutional and physical arrangement that harnesses the potency and the benefits that each of the constituent units and ethnic nationalities will bring to the table. And that was how, after much deliberation, the 1960 constitution was vetted with governance, fiscal, and other provisions, resource production and control arrangements that allowed the constituent units to be actually semi-autonomous, just like we currently have today in the United Arab Emirates, seven semi-independent Emirates, which fuse together and share the same security, the same common international relationship. As at that 1960, the regions grew at their own pace. They controlled 50% of whatever resources that they generate within their environment. 30% was paid to the central port and 20 for the use of the federal government of Nigeria just to take care of some of the limited uh, things in the exclusive list. The regions had their own security arrangement. The regions even have semi-embassies in America, in the UK. There was no need for anybody to pick up, to go to Abuja, to uh, Lagos then. And again, in 1963, we had a, an updated constitution. Remember that we had three regions after independence. But in 1963, another region was created, the old Midwestern Nigeria. The people went and they had a play besides. They decided they want to be carved out of the region where they were. And they were allowed to carve that region, semi-autonomous too. That was a true federal physical republic. Of course, that republic was destroyed by Gowon when he wanted to concentrate resources to enable him to prosecute the civil war. And Nigeria has not yet recovered from it. The 1999 constitution that we currently operate is known to everybody. It's a fraudulent contraption patched together by Abdul Salam Abaka and few of his cliques. And we have continued to stumble, to lumber over the last 24 years since we started this republic. And as Ndibo is actually making, okay, look at what is happening to Naya Delta today. What happened in Okwama? All these things you see is because of the flood, because of the of the of the of the, of the uh, 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 you know fraudulent nature of the kind of constitution that we are running. And the, what Ohaneza has simply said: this idea of Maman the work, Babun the chop, is not helping Nigeria. One of the reasons why the constituent units, the governors, are not looking inward to develop the latent resources in their states, the potentials. To even provide security is because of the kind of physical and consular deformities that we have today. And if we are very sincere, and I say it with every sense of responsibility, if we are very sincere and honest, even the good book, the Bible says, when Jesus Christ was talking, he said, some of you pay so much emphasis on times and kumims, but you forgot the weightier matters, which is more important than law. The matter of justice, the matter of fairness, the matter of equity. And that is what Ohanese is simply asking. Can we go back and look at what was the foundational basis upon which this relationship was better? It is unfair for a canoe to have 44 or 45 for four local government area. Whereas a Lagos that produce more resources than any other state in Nigeria has only about 20. It does not make sense. Lagos may have the smallest landmass in Nigeria. But Lagos is the biggest economy the fifth biggest in Africa. If we have a physical and constitutional framework that mirrored what our founding fathers mutually agreed to, Lagos should be controlling 50% of whatever it is put. And let me tell you what it will do. It will be an incentive for these constituent units to make sure that their state is protected against insurgency, against the kind of militancy that we have everywhere around Nigeria. Okay. One of these is why Dubai is one of the most secured states in, region in the, in the world. Why United Arab Emirates is the most secured, one of the most peaceful countries in the world. It's because of this kind of confederal arrangement. 
Mr. They are, they go every inch of the way to protect their land and make it a habitable paradise out of desert for everybody. Mr. Barry, um, you've highlighted why the why Ohaneze Indigbo is making these calls. Now, what will the practicality of answering these calls look like? Are we looking at a constitutional review? Is there a time frame that uh, what, that Ohane is, in the, is looking at having this achieved? Because in that report, it was mentioned that they're assembling lawyers to sue the Nigerian government if the demands are not being met. So what will that picture look like? And what will be the likely time frame? Um, I cannot actually say what the likely time frame will be because that will be the call of the President General of Ohaneze Ndibo worldwide. But if we live in a just and fair and equitable society where men have the fear of God and love for humanity, I expect the current President of Nigeria, who has actually been at the forefront of solving national conference, who have actually been at the forefront of physical federalism, true physical federalism, right from his days as the governor of Lagos State, to go all the hog and they use his enormous powers and influence to mobilize the National Assembly to do the right things and right the wrongs. You know, I, fi I find this so disheartening when I see from every National Assembly, the Seventh Assembly, the Eighth Assembly, every time they will set up committees, we will waste resources on a constitutional amendment. At the end of it, nothing comes out of it. I say it and I say it again. If we are very honest and sincere with ourselves, there is no need wasting the scarce resources setting up committees. Go back and fish out the 1960, the 1963 constitution that was agreed to in a marriage, in a union. All the parties coming into that union must agree on things that will make them live together harmoniously in a prosperous atmosphere. All they should simply do is to fish out the 1963 constitution modify it to suit our current contemporaneous need and the demography of six regions. Let the regions be the confederating units. The regions can now go back and decide whether they want to create 10 states or whether they want to create 20, whatever. For All right, are you there? Okay. The, let the constituent units, let the, the federating units be let the federating units go ahead be the the regions let the federating units be the regions and let us uh, embrace and let us just ensure the same physical the same social economic the same governance arrangement that was in that 1963 constitution and if we do this only mark it in the next 10 years with the kind of Potentials will unleash in this country. Nigeria will become one of the top biggest, ten, ten biggest economies in the whole world. All right. All right. Anyway, um, take us through um, your plans for the um, Igbo retreat, which is billed to hold in um, Delta State from March 30 to um, April uh, the 2nd and thereabout. Um, are these conversations also going to be held there? And if uh, while answering that, we also like to know um, what the plans are, especially for Hanez Indigo, looking ahead uh, to the political um, climate that we've seen here in Nigeria. Um, let's talk about the, the retreat. Let's just look at um, Hanez Indigo's um, statements and plans uh, for what we're seeing currently in Nigeria's political system. I am not aware of any retreat in Asaba on the 30th. Um, the only retreat that Ohaneze had, remember, we have only one Ohaneze. Ohaneze that is led by Chief Iman, Dr. Emmanuel Iwanyangu, Ahiji Agamba of Igbo Land, the Guruguru. And uh, he's the president of Ohaneze worldwide. Any other persons or people parading themselves as Ohaneze group are stars. And the Imobi Ndibo. We we'll take out, we we'll take Imo Bindi, but we we'll take urgent steps to address. Mm. Are you there? I'm here. And the Imo Bindi, but we we'll take out time to address some of these imposters that have been dragging the Igbo name and the image and reputation to the mud. I am privileged to be selected to be the chairman of the Agri committee of Alibo. And that is what I have the brief 
and which I have the brief to talk about. You all agree that the Southeast region is the smallest region in Nigeria in terms of landmass, 28,000 square kilometers, which is 2.8 million hectares, but mostly arable land with the right amount of rainfall and the right amount of sunshine, the water tributaries, and some of the most highly intelligent human capital the world has ever seen. Our brief simply is to help midwife a very robust missions, community, diaspora, private public partnership arrangement that will enable us to grow the Southeast economy to grow about 7 trillion Naira agro wealth in the Southeast economy over the next eight years. A 7 trillion Naira wholly agro and agro food for value chain economy that will create sustainable about 600,000 jobs on an annual basis in the Southeast and 1.2 million indirect jobs. A, a, a agro value chain that will be able to create at least 10,000 sustainable millionaires annually from the Southeast agripreneurs. We have developed the roadmap and we, we, we in Ohanese, I believe that our governors will provide the political will and support because the governors control the land by this of the land use act and help us to mobilize resources to provide security within our region to be able to recreate the visions of Dr. Michael Lockman, a 39 year old medical doctor in 1959, when he became a. Oh. Fastest growing economy in the whole of the Commonwealth. And that is an economy that grew at 9% per annum, creating over 214 kilometer industrial belt. Most of the legacies of Michael Lockman are still existing today. So basically, our brief is to work with our hand, work with Ndibo, both at home and in diaspora provide the framework on how we will drive this process, the designing, the structuring, the funding, the execution, under a very unique, never seen before, using the Igbo apprenticeship model, a missions, community, diaspora, private, public partnership arrangement that will unleash such a mega fund that Africa will come to the Southeast to come and learn how to grow wealth without, uh, with enterprises. All right. Um, there's so much, uh, so much plans that are be, that are unfolding, and we look forward to getting updates from you regarding uh, the plans for Ohanes and Debo. Uh, I think on a final note, uh, I'd like you to share with us, you know, what your view is. I, I, I know you've touched on that, but I'd like you to give us a bigger picture for you know the, the perspective or Ohanes and Debo stand regarding where Nigeria's current climate is, where we are and projections for where you know your organization organization would like to see Nigeria heading to. Oh, and just like every other group in Nigeria, Afani Ferre, the Middle Eastern Forum, Arewa Community Forum, the Sokapu, and all manner of other groups. Ohanes and believe so much in the unity of Nigeria. Ohanes and believes convincingly that Nigeria is better together under a constitutional and physical arrangement that ensures equity, fairness, and equal partnership for all the diverse ethnic nationalities in Nigeria. Ahanez Ndibo believes practically that the current problems we are grappling with are foundational and can easily be sorted out. But they can only be easily sorted out when we decide to be collectively honest with each other. And we know that there is no part of this country that does not have things to bring to the table. There is no part of this country that cannot add so much value. We can actually synergistically help each other to work together to create a nation where poverty is reduced drastically to less than 2%. Of course, the Bible says that the poor must always be in your midst. The poor here yeah, is simply, simply means those who refuse to work, those who refuse to do what they are supposed to do to be able to come out of poverty. Our next thing people want a constitution and a country that gives everybody equal opportunity as long as you're resident, you're dedicated, you're diligent, as long as your limbs are intact, you can be able to unleash your potentials. We are the son of nobody can become the son of somebody. That is why we have the Republican nature of the Igbo man. We are not trying in any form of manner to equate ourselves more than any other person in Nigeria. We are simply saying we are brothers. This thing has brought us together under one roof as one country. And therefore, we must try as much as possible to make the best use of this one. Nigeria is a great place with great people. We mm. just need to remove mm. some of those constitutional, physical chisms that have allowed some few of us 
we leverage on those things, little things to divide us, rather than harmonizing on those things that can bring us together. Simple right. thing is very simple. Get the 1963 constitution. If I am a governor today, that is the only thing I will pursue in my agenda. If I'm in the National Assembly, and that is why I look at the political class and I feel so sorry. I weep most of the time when I go into meditations at the kind of huge potential being wasted in this land. Let us go back to rebuild the foundation of Nigeria. If the foundation is faulty, there's nothing the righteous can do. When we rebuild this foundation, I tell you, Olive, in 10 years, other nations will line up to get visa to come to Nigeria. But until we fix those foundational issues, this country will continue to totter on the precipice. All right. I mean, there's, there are other questions I would have loved to ask, but because of our time, I would have loved for us to look at... Um, uh, the Apex uh, Northern Social Cultural Group, which is uh, the Arawa Consultative Forum. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, back and forth uh, conversation they're having with Ohanes in Dibu, especially concerning the statement that was made uh, concerning um, Gowan um, having to apologize to Ohanes in Dibu. And uh, they feel that that was taking it too far. But we will try as much as possible to have you back on the show next week. And of course, also have the National Publicity Secretary. Uh, who would be here as well. Hopefully, we can clear the dust in the air and have that conversation when it's time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks for staying with us here on Breakfast Central. It was indeed a mixed feeling um, at the Kuriga community located in the Chikun local government area of Kaduna State as villagers uh, tripped out en masse to welcome their children who were kidnapped three weeks ago. The children who spent uh, indeed 16, um, uh, you could say, complete, yes, yeah, 16 days in captivity uh, were abducted from the uh, Leah Primary School Corrigo on March the 7th, but were later rescued by the military on Sunday, the 24th in Zampara State. Now, of course, our correspondent um, who has been there has been following closely this story. We're talking about Marvelous Obomanu, and he's joined us several times here on Breakfast Central to break down um, uh, the situation report, what's happening. Um, how the State House indeed ensured that there were no journalists who, were, um, who got into uh, the building to cover the story clearly. Uh, most importantly, uh, he also spoke about uh, the chances of ensuring that the parents uh, would get their children, especially on the first day. Uh, the numbers has also been a cause for concern, um, um, inconsistency in the numbers of how many children there were and how many um, that are or were rescued. There's also the story of the teacher who had been killed. And uh, most of all, we also saw the story of the fact that uh, the children have finally been reunited uh, with their parents. Well, our man is back again this morning on a Friday. Marvelous Obamanu joins us. Uh, good morning to you, Marvelous. Yadi? Yeah, good morning. Great. Uh, can you give us an update? Um, what was it like yesterday when the parents have, uh, finally um, held on to their child or children? Uh, what was the emotion like? And tell us also the atmosphere as well. What did it bring? Well, uh, it was um, a spontaneous flow of emotion yesterday at Kuriga where um, visibly parents were shedding tears of joy, you know, seeing their children being reunited back to that community. In fact, both um, adults, children, old, small, all of them trooped out a mass to welcome these children. And then something you know, extraordinary happened. Immediately, the children started the government vehicle that was bringing these children to their community. All of them all ran towards that, you know, vehicle. Immediately, the children highlighted, come and see the, you know, the emotion. The parents were hugging their children. All of them were falling on the ground, crying, shouting, you know, just to see these children who had been held captive in the last 16 days. So it was, you know, a bit of a high emotion. And to better paint this picture is, assuming you, maybe you have someone, maybe your lover or your wife, whom you traveled for a long distance, and then you tell the, your wife that you're coming back. Anytime he or she hears a knock, he's always on an expectant mood, you know, waiting to see you come back. That was how, you know, this community were all waiting for these children till they arrived yesterday. So it was a bit of emotion, mixed feeling, as they saw their children yesterday. Right. Uh, I, I really am glad to hear that they've been reunited because one of the issues we complained about was the fact that they had been kept away too long from their parents. And now, do we also have clarity regarding the numbers? Are we certain that every parent that came there was reunited with their children? I'm asking, of course, 
because as we, we've been talking about this, it was 287 initially reported at the time of return or rescue, whichever the case may be, we had 137. So have there been any parents who have uh, spoken up to say that they're yet to find their children? Do we have clarity regarding these numbers yet? All right. Um, just uh, your guess is as good as mine. We're thinking, you know, initially we were hearing 287 and then we're hearing 137. So everybody's guess was, okay, when we get to the community, if there are, you know, parents who didn't see their children, then they will raise the alarm. So, but when we got to the community yesterday, when all the whole children arrived and then the parents were reunited with their children, we didn't see anybody, you know, saying that I didn't see my child or this. So what it means that probably that 137 is the original figure. And I can confirm to you that every parent in Kuriga yesterday all met with their children and have reunited with their children. Because some of them said that initially, while they were taking them captive, some of them escaped. You know, you know I told you, they left so those ones that are very young to go back. Some of them escaped. And then, of course, some of the children there told us how, you know, the principal had died. They said from the very moment they picked them up to they got to Zanfra, they've been bullying the principal. And in fact, the torture was so much that he couldn't withstand it. And of course, he died. And the children said they were giving them food just two times every day. And before they would go to urinate or go to sleep or go to do anything, they would first jog. In fact, the little children, as early as 14, 15, all of them were you know, being taught. Before they give them food, before they go to urinate, anything, they will first of all do jogging. And then, of course, in fact, they were telling us that the human treatment they faced was so much. And that is why some of them were crying that, wow, is this a miracle that finally they have left their captive then? Hmm. Uh, a, lo a lot has been said there. But let's, let's unpack this further. Uh, marvelous. Um, you talked about how the teacher died. I mean, the children expressed and shared how the teacher died. Um, have the press, including yourself, um, have you been allowed to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with the parents? And were other uh, pressmen equally allowed to get into the building and gain access to the parents so they can talk to them? That's one question for you. In, in short, just go ahead and answer that one first. All right. Um, just like I've told you, since this whole you know, um, rescue operation started and since on Sunday, I, I will tell you that um, the government is trying to shield journalists from having a full coverage of the rescue and some of the attendant issues that had emanated. Just like yesterday, no media house was allowed to follow them to come to Kuriga. In fact, why we were there? Because already we learned that they were coming to Kuriga. So we went ahead of them. In fact, when they saw us there, they were surprised. They only came with just um, the government in-house uh, pressmen that came, but no other media organization was allowed to, you know, come to Kuriga, except just New Central and then one other media organization because we had already had the fact that they were coming and then we went ahead to wait for them at Kuriga. So they, I don't know why they've been shielding journalists from having access to the children or the parents. But of course, some of the parents who spoke will say they are happy to have their children reunited with them. And of course, that all this why they've been in captivity, they've not been able to close their eyes. Then one thing also stand out, you know that the, um, the governor had deployed, said that Inspector General of Police deployed 200 police personnel and two armored car ve vehicles to, to Kuriga. But while we are joining, we didn't even see any of those armored car you know, carriers or the police that they said they had deployed. In fact, the last time I was at Kuriga, at least I counted about 19 security checkpoints. But this time around, we went yesterday, we just counted about 11. And of course, from, from, some of us were saying, okay, since we even had the 11 on the road, is because the deputy governor was coming to Kuriga. But security is still a challenge in that community. And again, if you've seen the school structure there, you see how dilapidating their building is. So if these children are going back to that particular LEA primary school to continue their education, would they continue school under that structure that is bad? You know, these are some of the issues. I mean, you painted a very sad picture, sad but real picture of the situation and the current state of things. And I completely agree with you that the state of the schools from which they were kidnapped is nothing to write home about. Uh, oh, talk to us about the parents' reaction to, I don't know if you're able to get that, to the governor's promise to give the students a scholarship and as well as the family of the murdered teacher. Yes, um, the, the governor did say he's awarding scholarship to all the 137 children. And of course, the family of the principal who died, he's also going to assist them. Yes, that is what he said. It's a good one if you look at it. But the question still remains that if you're giving these children scholarship, is this scholarship to continue their education in that community? Or are they going to go outside of their community to start their education? Now, when you look at what is happening in Kuriga, as I'm talking to you now, 
the school is still is, is, is a far cry. So if you are giving them scholarship, will they continue education there? Or the one who still lies in you to find a way to build up that school so that it becomes conducive and better for children to, you know, school. And then I can also tell you that while we were journeying to Kuriga yesterday, a lot of communities have all been deserted. A lot of schools have all been deserted. So a lot of people living around that, that, that Chikum local government are living in fear because they are saying they don't know which school will be attacked the next. And government has not provided much security to reassure this, you know, resident that, yes, this kind of thing will not repeat itself again. So there is a need to provide more security and also, you know, make these children believe and their parents that, yes, the schools are safe, the schools are protected. Because most of the schools we saw around that area have all been deserted. Most of the communities have all been deserted. And I'm glad that you highlighted this because I also wanted to ask you uh, what the impact of this has had on the education system within that local government area to see if schools are still opening and if parents are still sending their children to school. And I'm hoping that you have some time to speak to the parents as well, the parents of these children, to find out if they'll be open to sending them back to school. Um, I, I, I want to ask you personally now, on the, on the personal note, how would you say this story has impacted you? You followed the story from the beginning, Marvelous. You followed it up until now, when these children have been, you know, they've regained their freedom and they've been reunited with their parents. How would you say that the story has impacted you? Well, um, you know, this is not the first time we're having mass abduction of school children in Nigeria. And in fact, uh, personally, I would say this is an attack on Nigeria's education system, of course. And in this Kaduna state, you saw when um, children in Baptist High School was abducted. The one in, of course, the uh, forestry, the, um, some other schools in Kaduna state have, where children have been mass abducted. And of course, when you go back, especially we, we, we went back to that Baptist High School and the situation we saw there was, you know, um, a bit of, uh, well, uh, would I say disappointing that most children have left that school and some of them have, you know, all come to Kaduna Town to start their education. So personally, this is an attack on Nigeria's education system. I don't think Nigerians should see this as just a Kaduna State problem alone or an attack in, in, in the Northeast, North Central. You know, when Boko Haram started, we all thought it's just a Northeast something. See, all of them started manifesting in different angles. We see the bandits in, in, in the North Central here. We see, you know, unknown government in the Southeast and all the rest. So I think it is time that all the whole governors should have, you know, a meeting to discuss how to, you know, tackle this issue of mass abduction because children, parents are living in fear to send their children to school. And of course, at the end of the day, we are going to see brain drain because if children are not going to school to acquire basic education because of fear of being kidnapped, and you heard, we found some of them told us that they have to pay bandits just to go to their farm to cultivate or, you know, to harvest their farm produce. So these are a lot of issues that I think that government needs to sit down, have a holistic approach, you know, and, you know, have a meeting with the locals because security is local. You know, meet with traditional rulers, meet with these locals, and in fact, the call for state police should be apt at this moment in time because when, if we don't tackle this issue carefully, we might have brain drain in this country where children and parents will not have the opportunity to send their children to school because they don't know when they send them to school or probably these bandits can come and attack again. So I think we need to you know, look at this issue holistically and find a way to tackle you know, this issue because mass abduction in Nigeria, especially in terms of school, is becoming alarming, especially here in Kaduna State. Mm. I want to say thank you so much, Marvelous Obomadu. You've always been on top of the game. Thank you for staying true and uh, being our eyes and ears and nose, especially there in Kaduna. Do stay safe and have a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. And if you're just joining us, it's time for us to review the papers. We'll be joined by public affairs analyst Razak Olokova, who will be shedding light on some of the big stories on the front pages. Good morning, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Happy. Happy Easter. 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 Yes, so it's true. <laughs> ah, you know, as journalists, well, we don't usually... Good, right? good Friday, yes. We don't really feel these holidays because we're working every day. 24-7. So. <laughs> All right, let's see what this Nigerian newspaper is saying this morning. On the front page of this Nigerian newspaper, we can see the story there. It says, gunmen set ablaze police station local government secretariat in Anambra. We scare away policemen as state command denies abduction. Troops kill 212 terrorists, capture 252 in one week in Anambra, Eboin, others. On the gubernatorial election updates, I'm not afraid of Aida Tiwa, says Jimo Ibrahim, joins race. Detained finance executives sue NSA and EFCCO. 
Ojuku's will, Bianca wins on estate property. It's interesting uh, to see that it's been, it's been such a long time that this conversation has been going on and now he's finally won this. FAA and shuts down KFC at Lagos Airport over discrimination against persons with disability. Okwama killing, it must never happen again. Defense headquarter vows. Declares eight suspects wanted, fallen of false process. So many stories to look at. Um, I think we should start with, um, let's talk about the Okwama killing, of course. Uh, defense headquarters saying it must never happen again. Eight suspects have been declared, including the traditional ruler, who has submitted himself to the police for investigation and says that uh, his, his hands are clean. And they were seeing that also the government has provided scholarship for the students and the children of uh, the diseased soldiers, uh, diseased horsemen. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this story? Uh, well, we should do everything possible to ensure that this kind of thing stops in Nigeria. Both sides, our children, the army and the militants, what led to it, we have to investigate it. The hostility in Nigeria data must find a way of putting an end to it. And that's why when we look back at the opportunity given to Jonathan, we feel sober for the, its reluctance to do the needful in terms of uh, putting the country in a proper structure to avoid this hostility. We met him several times with content of the danger of not doing the right thing because uh, the oil in Nigeria is the source of all this. Take people's attention away from oil. We have other resources. We have things that can make us superpower that we can use to construct intercontinental ballistic missiles. We have uh, a lot of things. So, and that's the direction I think the president should be looking at. That's one. Two, the lesson from Okoma is uh, a point of advocacy and engagement to us as a people that you don't cross certain lines. Once certain lines are crossed, the question of human rights is suspended. The moment you kill a police officer, the moment you kill a soldier, it's a universal standard. Any country that you kill their soldier, we will witness something that is similar to what is happening in the woman. We took about to court on OD massacre. But we couldn't achieve much because the first uh, preamble to the case was that uh, what, was, what led to this? And the moment it was ascertained that some police officers were killed and this and that, so it became a different ball game. And that's why it took people a long time to call terrorists, uh, Israel a terrorist nation because there were something that led to it. It was when it became clear that uh, there are other motives to what Israel is doing. That was how people came out. But people felt it was a balance before. Ah, you can't kill my people and fold arm. So we should do something to that. And on this uh, Okoma's case, my appeal goes to the people of uh, Nigeria. There seems to be a particular pattern in how crisis is resolved in Nigeria that all Nigerians must begin to appeal to the elders there. If you look at rivers, there's no governor in rivers that did not fight its predecessor. That's not a good thing for democracy. Or oh, Amici fought Odili, uh, Wiki fought Amici, Kubana fought uh, uh, Wiki. So that acts is the way people put their hand in it. The way out of it is for Nigerians to understand that uh, these are human beings, these are our brothers. Stop playing politics with their life. Let's do something with them because the genesis of the matter shows clearly that uh, there were some issues on ground before the killing. I'm not supporting the killing of the soldiers. So we must do something about it. And it is good that uh, people come out. If you don't know anything about it, you have to come out. If you are declined wanted, come out. During the military, we can't come out because Abacha has made up his mind that. Uh, <laughs> but in, at no time was we run away from being questioned by uh, the police. So. Um, what the government has done is commendable mm. to compensate uh, and do something about it because mm. our children are dying every day and the morals are getting low. The involvement of military men in activities like this, you know, we all know the reason. Police in Nigeria are not up to 200,000. One third are following VIPs around and VIPs deserve to be followed about. <laughs> if you see Dangote in anywhere today, in fact, anybody who want to kidnap him. <laughs> So, one third is also doing administrative work, bail work. It's only the remaining one third that is securing the life of 250 million. You can see how ridiculous it is. So, Army will complement. 
And the danger is that army are not public relations officer of your country. They can't go to any community and go and appeal to citizens. If you go, if they go, if they go to anywhere, psychologically, army is programmed to go and kill, to go and defend, kill or be killed. So it's difficult to re to rework their psychology to go and become um, placating people. You can slap a police officer when there's, there's an uprising in the community and you will find a way of making sure the person is arrested and tried. If you slap an army officer, it's danger. The, the person has endangered his life. So this limits the way we are, will push the army to engage with uh, uh, the civilians. It's a, it's, it's a contradiction for us. So what's something must be done about And that is why we have, we have to uh, uh, assist Nigerian police by bringing up a, a new layer of security. I'm talking about state, local, so and also, you also numerous police. for the state police, so you could actually help. It's a universal standard. The... You can't have a, a country like Nigeria. The moment you have federal, state, and local government, mm -hmm. the most appropriate thing is to have federal, state, and local police. State laws should be enforced. You can't ask the federal government to up, uh, enforce state laws properly. They won't do that appropriately. And that is why it is very, 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 very important. It's been established that uh, if you have run this kind of uh, security uh, institution, the life of people will not be secured. There will be friction between the police and, and, and the civilians. And you know, one thing that we, don't, we are not looking at the direction, it was small, smaller crimes have become bigger crimes. The state can curb smaller crimes. Kidnappers don't be born kidnappers one day. It's, it starts from pickpockets. Then it, it begins to graduate. So states have the responsibility of blocking that recruitment platform for banditry. Because where bandits will recruit is where all short community will recruit. Smaller, smaller crime. So it's the local people that will curb smaller crimes. The local people, the state police. So in all of this, it boils down to the need for or the government and the people as a shared responsibility to speak in unison that attention must be paid to our security network and the plight of the Niger Delta people. We are taking the oil of the soil. It will ask for its implication one it's, day. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. What you are saying, this is not what I'm talking about. There's a bigger picture coming of what is happening in Niger Delta. Okay. The earthquake we are witnessing today was a result of abuse of uh, environment sometime in the past. It's not now. So we are talking about passing the buck to our children. But if you don't provide their resources to them, if they don't take care of their future, that's their cup of tea. But if the entire nation is dipping pipe and sucking it, it's not fair. It's what led to all of it. So the, 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 the immediate solution is what we have said. But the, the bigger solution is to resolve the Nigeria crisis and resource control. Let's control our resources. All right. Okay, let, let, let's take a look at another uh, paper at the moment. We've seen um, this Nigeria. Let's go to Daily Independent. Let's see what Daily Independent has in store for us um, this particular time. Uh, Daily Independent on the front page there. It says, we follow due process. Uh, BOT can't take over party according to Labour Party. Uh, that's the Board of Trustees. I'm, I'm very sure you're aware of, yeah, of what's course. going on. And uh, it's a conversation we also look to have uh, uh, this second hour when we do have the spokesperson for the Obidati uh, presidential campaign movement join us later on. Uh, so we follow due process. Uh, uh, BOT can't take over party. LP uh, says so-called BOT chair. Others left party over 20 years ago mm, when the party was formed. Anyway. DHQ declares professor, woman, six others wanted of a killing of 17 soldiers. Uh, says uh, King school children uh, played significant role in rescue efforts. That'll be the Kuriga school children. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And then what the president has warned against. <laughs> Don Polo <laughs> says he will not listen. <laughs> the year what? <laughs> and he goes ahead to put the advert celebrating. Uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu at 72 years, Tantita, uh, Tantita Security Services, uh, ever since they came on board. Uh, it's been a mixed reaction. I have a question to ask you, though. Uh, it's not in the papers, but I'd like to get your view on that. But first off, let, let's look at uh, Labour Party and its crisis. What do you make out of it? Holding a national 
convention behind closed doors? No, parties uh, uh, have their rules. If the rules allow for such, they can give numerous excuses, security, or there may be other peculiar reasons why they must do that. But all, everybody must agree. Everybody must agree. This can be the decision of a, of a faction. That's one. Two is that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the labor union should stay out of this. But why? You belong to Nigerian School of Journalism. Can you form a political party? You can't form a political party. Conflict so, of interest? That's what yes. you're meant to be a neutral. So, so neighbor, we have, I have this recurring argument with labor over so many issues. Me, Pascal Bafi, I left and Oshia Mole came in. We have been having that issue that the face what concerns you. You talk about so, uh, price control, you said no. You talk about looking at the so, you said no. It's only salary increase. Then suddenly you want to start becoming the party yeah, chairman of uh, the NLC labor. said that they formed the Labour Party, then known as the People's um, uh, Economic, uh, um, uh, 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 People's, uh, I can't remember the name right now, but in 2022. You cannot bring a molde. In 2002. That is different from the political model we operate in Nigeria. And in 2002, they said the party was formed so that... It's uh, wrong, people, then. People below um, the Kedar, or people in the Kedar of, um, if you are a, a, a damn food driver, you are a shoemaker, you now have a party that will speak for you. As NLC, it is not correct. What it means is that uh, once you become, once you are a worker in Nigeria, you automatically, automatically become a member of a... Uh, Labour Party, which is not correct. So it means that NMA too can form a political party. NBA can form a political party. So there are so many errors and misconceptions yeah, people have about why did, So why did INEC at that time you see, oversees the, the entire political It, it is system. wrong. We also, Nigeria's public Admit. anger. Nigeria's public anger at times is scary to me. Mm. What do I mean by that? Once you see, and it's universal, once Public opinion takes a decision. Everybody starts leaning. Yes. yes, even if it is wrong. Yeah, party, our party is our political party. So I never became scared that uh, this is a tsunami. I can't stop it though. More so, 2022 was a time when we don't, the party, the INE does not want to have any a long issue with uh, 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 such people like, uh, organization like Labour. They will be consumed. So a lot of things were allowed to pass. Now, we are consolidating. Consolidation of democracy has only been achieved in West Africa by Ghana. It means return to democracy. A party wins. That party loses. Opposition becomes the incumbent. Tunubu spent eight years. Somebody comes after him. They lost again. Somebody came on board. That's complete consolidation. So, incidents like this are part of issues that come up in our democracy that gives us consolidation. We don't know before, but the implication is coming out gradually. Then for BOT and the main body, what does the constitution say? It is true. Constitution, except there's crisis. And the crisis at hand is not an internal crisis. It is a party of aberration. It's a crisis of aberration. When LEC says that uh, you can preside over the party, that is wrong. So the appropriate thing is for labor. The BOT, all of them to put their heads together. There must be credible opposition. With this, the public will not take their opposition serious again. If you can do that to yourself. So you want us to rely on anything you say about, uh, about the incumbent. I want a strong opposition. As much as uh, I have flair for the incumbent part, but I still want opposition to be strong. Because that is the only guarantee you have that uh, APC will be on their toes. If there's, if there's somebody watching them, that's not good for our democracy. What is happening now? I'm not, I don't, I, I don't belong to the Labour Party. I don't, it's not like it for me to join. But I don't like what is happening to them. I want them to be strong. I want them to come back. Because what opposition means essentially is that uh, this is how we could have done it better. That's what opposition means. So who will be telling APC now that uh, this is how we could have done it better? Look at the, the dollar issue, the security issue, and numerous issues on ground. It means nobody will say anything about it again. It will not remain we, we, because I, I, I am I, from I, the I, I, see, I see the angle you, you, you So, so, so it is well. good for them to put their ass together. I also want PDP to also put their ass together. They need to be strong. 
just we like need, we, we need <laughs> people to design something that is called alternative. A formidable opposition. opposition. If APC is not doing that, then give us your impression of what the economy should yeah. look like. Although people yeah. argue that they are the same. We argue yeah, that they are the same. That's it. People, they are called that. These are all. I mean, just Richard recently we saw what happened in um, 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 Enugu State. Oda Ineke responsible for that. Five. Oda Ineke responsible for that. Five Liberal well, Party. Yes, you should hold Inek so because five, five Inek must insist defecting to PDP. Inek must insist that you must, you must have an ideology. Once you have an ideology, there's no how Trump can become a member of a Democrat. Hmm. Because Trump has a view, first about gun control. The view of Republicans is that uh, when someone comes to your, your house to rob, there must be funnel on both sides. <laughs> That's the definition of Republican self-defense for you. Democrats say no, I mean, that is uh, true to the extreme. The broker class says that then, I can't be working and someone will pretend that it's not working, you'll be giving me a welfare program. No, it's not acceptable to me. Mission is a popular opinion. The broker class says all fingers are not equal. So, this type of thinking, people don't switch it. Okay. But when you don't have a serious manifesto, that's what happens. The question is whether they have a serious manifesto, but that's a conversation for another day. We're out <laughs> of time. Let's quickly look through the front pages of our final paper this morning. And uh, we're looking at the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. It says, Sekibo, Sekondos, Omeha, others pledge support for Tinubu, Fubara. And uh, we have Foodlums Attack and Amber Divisional Police Headquarter with IEDs. Ohama Killings Defense Headquarter declares eight suspects unwanted. How many three abducted? Uh, and uh, I think that's chatted me. I can't see what that word is. For 14 days and released edit. Oh, yes. How uh, the military, this is of course talking about the editor. It says, How military abducted and chained me for 14 days, released editor narrator deal. I want you to talk about that as yeah. quickly as you can. That, that, that's an abuse. It's not uh, good. I will encourage the man to go to court for that. The, even when it was a popular pattern to torture, and we still resist it. That is not correct. Not to talk of when we have a Democracy. It needs to approach court. There must be a redress. Our country, once and for all, <clears throat> the rest of us should look at us as serious minded people. When we travel abroad, you go and demand for a right that you don't enjoy here. And this is how to enjoy, you begin to enjoy the right. So, the man should not allow the case to die. In fact, the civil society has been looking at the issue and how to link up uh, uh, with the lawyer. There must be, and there are countless of other issues like that. Where army officer thinks that uh, that uniform is a license. You know what is even very annoying? Routine. How some of them, mm. two days ago I was on uh, Lekki Ekba Expressway, they're driving as escorts to wherever it is they're escorting, and they have Koboko out, almost like you enter away, we flog you. And I was just looking at them that, why does power intoxicate people so much? I know they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, but power can be so intoxicating. But yes, I completely agree with you. Mm. I hope he goes to court, mm. and I hope that uh, the court will do what he needs to do, and that he gets justice. He will get justice if you approach the court. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank All you. Right. All banks in Nigeria have been given a directive to recapitalize within the next 24 months and should present an implementation plan of how it will achieve this to the Central Bank of Nigeria before the 30th of April. A statement signed by the Director of Financial Policy and Regulations Department of the Apex Bank, Aruna Mustafa, disclosed the minimum capital base for a commercial bank with the international authorization will now be 500 billion naira for commercial banks with national authorization. The capital base will be 200 billion naira, while regional banks are expected to build their capital base to 50 billion naira. Well, CBN also pegs the new capital base for merchant banks at 50 billion naira, while non-interest banks with national authorization should improve to 20 billion naira capital base. Those with regional authorization should have a minimum of 10 billion naira capital base. The CBN provided options on how the banks can actualize the recapitalization, which includes injection of fresh equity capital through private placement rights issues and or offers for subscription, mergers and acquisitions, and or upgrade or downgrade of license authorization. The directive stressed that capital shall comprise of paid-up capital and share premium only. 
It stressed that the new capital requirement shall not be based on the shareholders' fund. This move initially hinted via the CBN governor, Laya Mikadoso, during the 2023 annual bankers' dinner is to enhance banks' resilience, solvency and capacity to uh, continue uh, supporting the growth of the Nigerian economy. Well, you get more details on uh, this new uh, policy, of course, by the CBN. Um, that would be at exactly 11 a.m. here on New Central's Business Edge. So do us a favor. Uh, make sure you tune into Business Edge and get uh, the insights, details, especially uh, with a guest who will be joining in to break things down. But then, away from the banking sector now, let's take you to one of the biggest stories that's making the rounds, especially uh, all through the week, started from a day before. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has come out to deny monitoring the National Convention of the Labour Party raising questions about the transparency and oversight of the party's internal processes. or well, the absence of INEC monitoring at the Labour Party's national convention has raised eyebrows among political observers who view such oversight as essential for ensuring the fairness and credibility of internal party elections, instigating questions behind INEC's decision not to monitor the conference, or beg your pardon, the convention. Well, to recall that yesterday on New Central's Politics HQ, suspended native treasurer of the uh, party, uh, Oluchi Okwara, disclosed that there was no convention. What we had, according to her, uh, was a joke. So I quote, she says, there was no convention. What we had was a joke taken too far, end of quote. She also revealed that she had written to INEC asking the body not to monitor the convention, citing non adherence by the party's leadership to electoral laws. Well, joining us uh, this um, morning to discuss uh, further, we do have the spokesperson for Peter B. Dati um, uh, Party, uh, that's the Labour Party spokesperson to uh, Peter B. And of course, Obi uh, Dati, the hashtag for the 2023 election, is still the spokesperson up until today. We do have uh, Inusa Tanko join us uh, uh, this very morning. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you so much for being here. In Nigeria. I can see you have a smile on your face um, uh, and it makes me happy to know that um, we hope to keep this smile alive as we have this conversation up until the end. Our questions, are, particularly my questions, are straightforward. Uh, there's no dilly-dallying. So my first question to you is, is Julius Abure the chairman for the Labour Party? Well, um, well. So I had a dream that uh, the labor processes of the claiming Nigeria will come out very soon. And despite the challenges and all, we are in the month of Ramadan. Everything will be done. Um, with regard to your question, as at the time in which the last convention or the leadership of Abu was the national chairman but now that a convention has held and the convention came with a lot of challenges uh, i.e with regard to the processes uh the rejection by the national uh, nigerian labor congress become a controversial issue and then for anybody that will pronounce whoever is the chairman of uh, the, the Independent Electoral Commission. So uh, that question will not be uh, uh, answered by me, but rather by the Independent National Electoral Commission. But this who thing, have the... Uh, we're struggling a bit with your audio. We're hoping that we're losing bits of your... You? Yeah, we're struggling with your audio. We Can hear you? some parts and then we, we lose bits of the conversation. But I'm glad that you Can mentioned you INEC. Yes, I can hear you, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to hear you for the rest of the conversation. I'm glad that you've mentioned INEC. Oh. Uh, INEC has disowned the elections, stating, that according to Section 82 sub 1 of the Electoral um, Act, that um, every uh, meeting or conference or congress should give 21 days' notice, including this. And as such, um, they have disowned this uh, convention that the Labour Party has seemingly held. So, is it safe to say that? There really was no convention at this point, and everything there was null, uh, void, and of no effect. 
it is the powers that be within the electoral system that will make they have made their position known. So that is the situation. So INEC has given you an Welcome back to Breakfast Central. We're having a discussion with uh, Mr. Yunusa Tanko, who joins us this morning. Um, let's see if we can do this um, over again as we proceed. So I did ask a question earlier, and of course, um, Olive also asked a question earlier, but I'm just going to go through my question, and um, I hope that we get the answers uh, very clearly. So my first question simply is, who is the current chairman of Labour Party? I did ask that initially. I didn't get a clear, uh, a clear answer from you. I'd like to get that answer. Who is the chairman of Labour Party? And why were uh, some of the uh, most notable names not at the National Convention? Uh, as of um, one week ago, before this particular National Convention, Julius Abure was the national chairman of the Labour Party. And when the convention took place, now us to tell us who the national chairman of the Labour Party is at the moment. So that question and answer remains with the independent electoral commission who have the power to monitor that to what took place at that particular convention. Uh, and, and that will be your answer if I may give you the position of of what they did at that particular convention. All right, and now that you've mentioned INEC, we'll bring in again INEC's position disowning the Congress, stating that uh, by, by virtue of Section 82 sub 1 of the Electoral Act 2022, that uh, they basically need 21 days notice. And they, uh, as a result of them not having gotten this 21 days notice, they have disowned or dissociated themselves from this Congress. So is it safe to say that there really was no Congress held and that everything there was no void and of no legal effect whatsoever. Well, you see, the questions you are asking have to be directed to INEC. They have the power, literally, according to Electoral Act, it says that you have to notify INEC about a convention 21 days before that time. But remember, uh, as far as we are concerned within this particular um, scenario, there have been in the newspapers and in the social media, there have been a communication with INEC, whether it was done and the convention was supposed to start and to have happened in Edo State, it was shifted again to, um, it was shifted to Inewi. So you see there are three shifts in that particular process of 20, 21 days so that INEC can prepare itself towards the particular date and venue in which you gave. So, but changing it to INEC, and that I don't think probably INEC uh, uh, is happy about that. And so, therefore, if they acted, they will give you their position as, the, as what they think. And from what I have read, that they said they did not monitor that particular election, then it becomes a controversial election, null and void. Hmm. What exactly is going on with the Labour Party? Is it, has it become the case of what? Chidwa Achebe says when he uh, says when he said uh, things fall apart the center cannot hold because it would seem that every day it's one negative news or the other we're hearing about the Labour Party is the Labour Party falling apart? Okay, let me try and give you a, a, a kind of um, choreographed answer. The Labour Party is a child of necessity. I've been with the party for over let me overestimate let me say twenty five years. I've been with the party since um, chairman of blessed memory, and then uh, Julius Abri. And um, the truth about this is that the Labour Party has, has been struggling with issues, especially with the Nigerian Labour Congress. The Nigerian Labour Congress is the true owner of the Labour Party. I repeat, the Nigerian Labour Congress is the true owner of the Labour Party. And so they have a political commission. A politi the political commission is in charge of taking care and knowing the, um, the notice operandi of the party as it were. And this has been established. So 
when we have issues with uh, uh, Dan Oyan about issue of leadership. It dovetailed into the issue with uh, where, where, uh, it dovetailed into the leadership of uh, A. A. Salam. Then come in Aburi. At the time we was in the human rights circles and in the social um, uh, democratic movement in trying to get Nigeria on the right path. Nigeria on the right path. We all agree on what to do. And that was how the issue of Labour Party came in as a vehicle, most importantly, as a political party that would midwife our struggle. Hmm. Okay. Um, yes. I, yes. Um, anyway, uh, Mr. Yunisa Tanko, um, quite sad. We've been trying to, as much as possible to, um, to piece your words together, but I think the network is not in any way doing us a favor this morning. It's quite hard uh, to be able to um, extract uh, the words that you're saying in response to the questions that we're asking. So, I'm just going to use this uh, opportunity to simply um, crave your indulgence uh, that you join us um, next week when we're able to um, hear appropriately so we can possibly dissect these issues, especially for the benefit of the obedience and um, uh, the Labour Party uh, followers so they can actually hear you clearly, please. Uh, can we make it a date next week um, due to the uh, poor network connectivity? No problem. All right. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Um, it's quite a tough one. Um, great conversation we should have had there, but unfortunately the network says um, you, just need to, you just need to hold on. You don't need to talk so much about this um, until time permits, and I think that will be for next week. Absolutely. We're hoping that we can have this conversation and you know, look deeper into it. And maybe by then we'll have clarity and Aina could have spoken some more and the Labour Party officials would have spoken some more as well. We'll go on the break now and when we come back we have Which Way Nigeria? Stay with us. It's Good Friday and a number of Nigerians are asking what is good about the Friday. Now while Christians around the world are celebrating the core essence of Christianity, which is of course the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the average Nigerian who, in a bid to celebrate this with the normal festivities that surround Easter, cannot afford to. A number of them can't afford to feed, a number of them can't afford to buy fuel. They're struggling with light. Now we're talking about the kidnap situation in Kaduna. Thankfully, uh, we have 137 children who have been reunited with their parents after a lot of theatrics, it would seem. And now there's still more people who have been held in captivity. So again, we ask, what is good about the Friday? What is good about this uh, current economic climate where Nigerians are not sure of what's next, where there are speculations about what the current exchange rate is? One minute we're hearing about the Naira gaining and the next minute it's all propaganda. We're talking about the cost of goods and services in Nigeria. It's Nigeria that you see that the law of gravitation does not apply because what goes up hardly ever comes down. So again, we are asking what really is good, Nigerian government, about this Friday? where people are, of course, looking at the fact that many parents cannot afford to pay for school fees because it is someone who is alive and has been able to take care of their feeding, been able to take care of their needs, been able to put food on their table that will talk about education and talk about health care. We're seeing a large number of our medical professionals leaving the country, mass exodus. And even as I speak, I know that there are many doctors and nurses who their next earnest prayer is how to get out of this country. So again, I would ask the Nigerian government to look within and please help us make good this Friday. The average Nigerian just wants to be able to live a decent quality of life. Even as we wrap up International Women's Month, we talked about a number of the challenges that have bedeviled women. Of course, talking about uh, domestic violence and talking about inclusion. There are a number of these conversations that happen, and unfortunately, on the eve of International Women's Day, a number of women were kidnapped in Nigeria. We still don't have updates regarding that. So government, what is good about this Friday? So many questions to ask. So many answers yet to be received. And we're asking that the government looks into certain key areas to truly make Nigeria good for us again. And that's true.
and many are asking the question, let Good Friday be good. But then again, what's good about the Friday when the father is not able to provide that sumptuous meal that the family used to eat way back in time? What's good about the Friday when the cost of bread, which happens to be a staple food in the country, used to sell for 600 to 700 naira, is now selling for 1,600 up to 2,000 naira. Oh yes, I did see that yesterday. And what's good about the Friday when the healthcare system is still in an appalling situation where people are indeed crying and not able to afford just basic health care needs. And that leads to a lot of questions about what's good about the Friday. Your thoughts could be that you might hold on high to hopes and you might just look forward to a day when things will turn around and change for you. Or better still, it could be a good Friday when you receive a mail that your visa application has been granted to that Obodoyibo or a foreign country. So what's really good about the Friday? Olive. Indeed. I mean, for me at this point, it's important to say that the one thing that is good is the fact that the only thing we can hold on to right now is hope. We'll continue to ask these questions. We'll continue to hold the government to account. And we'll continue to hold on to hope. And for those of us who are people of faith, uh, people who are Christians, uh, I beg your pardon, I think that in this season as we celebrate Easter, the one thing that we hold on to is the hope of the resurrection, the hope of the second coming. And uh, that really is what is good about this Friday. Other than that, <laughs> I really haven't seen anything that is very good about the Friday. But it's, yeah. a, it, it's a tough one. It is really it's a tough worthy one. Of, of, of thinking about. But yes, uh, we'll keep asking these questions, asking our ministers to bring their score sheet. Next week when we come back on Which Way Nigeria, we'll be bringing ministers having their score sheet, marking attendance and roll call to see exactly what they have done. We'll be looking at the best performing ministers and the worst performing ministers. The ones who have gone on sabbatical ever since they got um, appointed, you know, ever since the screening and the announcements and the swearing in, a number of them have gone silent. Where are our ministers? So these are some of the conversations we'll be having. And we hope to also have updates regarding Kaduna and the kidnap cases. The number, multiple people that have been kidnapped in Kaduna, 137 have been brought back and reunited with their parents. What of the rest? It's not Uhuru yet, Nigerian government. And this is how we draw the curtain on this week's episode of Breakfast Central. The next time you'll see us, it'll be Easter Monday. So happy Easter, oh, everyone. It's a public holiday. Buddy. Yes, it is a public oh, holiday. Sorry, I forgot we don't have We don't have public holiday. holiday. Nothing for journalists. <laughs> We're hoping everyone is celebrating. And for Christians who are celebrating around the world, we're hoping that you're taking time to actually think, meditate, and reminisce on what Easter is about. It's not just about the drinking and the feasting, but also realizing what the core of your faith is, and more importantly, understanding the importance of sacrifice. Until we see you again, I am Olive Emodi. Cheers for you, Johansson. Uh, we'll see you again next week, Monday. Stay safe. Au revoir. Should I finish it in French yeah, now? Au revoir. Je suis. Au revoir. <laughs>